Hello. I'm so glad to see you. I know. We've never like talked in face to face before. I don't think we've acknowledged that though, because we just assumed that we already know each other. Which Isn't I that funny? I know. I feel like we already know each other. <laughs> You are definitely one of those people that I'm like, oh, yeah, we know each other. I mean, we've yeah. never met, but we know we each do. other. We do. Well, I have a strong pre-vetted friend policy where, yes. like, if the yes. friend, if, like, the friend vector coincides mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, we've already made commitments to love each other. And, yes. And, like, I'll never give her stuff back in a car. Yes. Box. We have a lot of friend overlap. And strong recommendation friend overlap. Like, you will love Kate, like, bossiness. Like, you will <laughs> yeah, love yeah. her. It comes okay. with a real aggression that yeah. I, I really appreciate. So anyway, okay, Kate. I like <laughs> you, I <laughs> guess. I'm being forced to. <laughs> okay, so you, okay, let me just say right from the get-go, though, your book was recommended to me. I can't even tell you how many times. Um, and as soon as I saw the title, which is Everything Happens for a Reason is Crossed Out, I was like, <laughs> Yes, this book is for me. This book is for me. Yes. Aww, thank it's, you for loving my evil heart. I mean, I love the book, but the title really. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> but no, it, yeah, it, and it was truly recommended to me by so many people who know me well and know, you know, Aww. my story, which is just that things happened that didn't really feel like there was a reason for. Yes. And still yes. don't. That's right. And still don't. And I mean, this book is pretty on brand for 2020, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a reason in so far as it's an invisible um, airborne uh, plague. Well, know, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Earth, yeah. But there is not a reason in so far as it is not visited upon us to teach us any moral or spiritual or no cultural or no. social lessons no this it's wasn't just, a gift from god me. it Maybe wasn't a gift from god to no, no, learn no, no. some yeah. lessons so that god could be glorified <laughs> yeah 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 it's very important that god gets glorified at the end of every pandemic yes it's like a whole thing god does yes yeah yeah create chaos and pain and suffering <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to glorify yeah, yeah. himself check yes <laughs> Good. 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 I wanted to be clear on that theology. (laughs) Great. We agree. All right. Why don't you read a little section from your book? Oh, sure. Well, it's all sad. So I picked one of the sad versions. (laughs) No. Um, (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And the subtitle uh, is right is everything happens for a reason and other lies I've loved. Yes. Uh, I was really struggling with um, uh, the constant feeling that I was like soaking up like the poison of what people explain is fair. And then just like trying to process um, being the subject of uh, so much explanation. Yeah. So not like I felt like, you know, the bad thing was out there. It was like the bad thing was inside of me telling mm. me that like maybe I deserved it or. Yeah. So anyway, so this is me secretly having some feelings about that. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. um, I say uh, control is a drug. And we're all hooked. Whether or not we believe in the prosperity gospel's assurances that we can master the future with our words and attitudes. I can barely admit to myself that I have almost no choice but to surrender, but neither can those around me. I hear it in my sister-in-law's voice as she tells me to keep fighting. I can see it in my academic friends who do what researchers do and Google the hell out of my problem. When did the symptoms start, they ask. Is this hereditary? Buried in all their concern is the unspoken question, do I have any control? A friend of a friend stops by with heaps and heaps of kale and flies around the kitchen with instructions about how to harness its healing properties. She's trying her best, I can see that, but I'm slumped against the counter, half listening in a fog of pain medication. Friends keep sending me recipes for green drinks and quinoa salads and others ship herbal supplements straight to my house. Just try, just try, they're saying. You can eat your way out of this. Tobin and I get into a stupid fight when he finds me eating a huge puffy Rice Krispies treat. Don't I know that sugar causes cancer? He doesn't even believe that food has caused my particular cancer, but all this talk of nutrition has infected him with a poisonous hope. Maybe I can be the cure. So that went, that went well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have so much to say <laughs> on all of that. We... We really like to try to find a reason and a cure. We really do, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have not had cancer, 
Um, but I had a similar experience around, um, I had eight miscarriages in a row. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it was just so interesting when I read your book because it was like I so recognized that need for other people to solve and to explain. Solve and explain. Um, so, okay, I'm going to read a section about that. Um, I started my birthday with another miscarriage. Um, I started to wonder if God was punishing me. I don't believe in a punitive God. I had already abandoned the notion of this cruel and vengeful God I'd learned about in my evangelical upbringing. But when you're in the middle of trauma and pain, your brain tries to make connections regardless of how irrational this may be. Your mind tries to process cause and effect, linking point A to point B. I started to wonder if this was happening for a reason. Was it because I hadn't pursued adoption first? Maybe my desire to adopt was a calling which is a fancy Christianese term for something that God tells you to do that you better not ignore, or also something you feel like doing, but don't want to explain yourself to a designated calling. <laughs> Maybe I was just being disobedient, selfish, biologically egocentric, or maybe I just didn't have enough faith. That thought was fueled by the advice of many well-meaning friends. Kristen, you've really just got to trust God on this, was a frequent res response when I shared how scared I was or sad and hopeless I felt. You're just going to have to have faith on this one, my friends would admonish me. But what is the subtext in that statement? Why do we tell people going through horrible circumstances to just have faith? It's terrible theology. It implies that our faith can guide outcomes. And yet, in my desperation, I began to buy it. During some of my miscarriages, at the first sign of bleeding, I would lay prostrate on the floor, crying out to God, making promises to trust him, proclaiming that I had the faith that he could heal me. And when he didn't, it crushed me. In those moments, I truly believed I could will God into miraculous action by the fervency of my faith. Christians don't like to sit with the idea that sometimes God doesn't save us from our pain. And when that inevitably happens, because pain and suffering are part of the human experience, we have a crisis of faith. This is the sticky thing about Christians in pain. Tragedy and suffering are bad press. If you didn't go up Christian, here's the peak backstage. We love a good redemption story, but we hate the messy middle. We want the story to come to a redemptive conclusion. We want to wrap it up in a pretty bow. Sure, you have been in pain, but then Jesus. We want to point to the place where God pulled us out of our pain, but when we can't find our way out of it, the narrative doesn't work. Why won't God suffer, save us from suffering? For what it's worth, this narrative around God saving us from suffering isn't something the Bible promises. But nevertheless, we believe it. Mm. Mm. Okay. So what, you know, have you figured this out? What, what is our deal <laughs> with wanting and needing to explain? Yeah. And have a reason and a purpose for anything sideways that happens in our life. Mm from finding a parking spot to being saved from an incurable disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, um, and one of the things uh, your book points out so beautifully, um, and especially in your understanding of messiness is that we often belong to traditions and institutions and communities that love the narrative more than they love us. Yeah. Like, Ooh. Yeah. And they like need the story to work out. Yes. And if we can't fit, we just like somehow intuit that if we can't fit into mm -hmm. the story that we won't be loved in mm -hmm. a way that we need to actually sustain our stupid lives. Yes. And like that is yeah. that. And like, that's a, that's a, and that's a betrayal on their mm -hmm. part. It just really feels, it just, it feels a lot like shame. It does. And I do, I, ha I do feel I have been betrayed. I mean, that's a good word. I don't think I could have named that before you said that, but I have been betrayed in that way where I felt like yeah. my pain was so uncomfortable and my lack of willingness to like, you know, yeah. kind of create a, nar a narrative around it yeah. that people have gone like, Ugh. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think your faith is slipping. Well, and we're, you know, and it's, 
we're storytelling machines. I get it. I do think we're like heat seeking missiles when it yeah. comes to wanting to like explain our lives and like figure out like yes. what the arc is, you know, uh-huh. cause it's hard to go through the middle if you don't think you're going to get to an end right. that's better than the like crappy, yes. horrible, right. unromantic mm-hmm. middle. Um, but like I, I do, and this is just my like historical hat I'll put over these enormous earphones. Um, but I do think that American culture has become particularly obsessed with a set of cultural scripts that it adopted in the late 19th century and that mm-hmm. just continue to um, not serve us well. Mm-hmm. And, and so that those in those sort of cultural myths yes. are in particular um, a rabid individualism, which <laughs> yeah. frankly people needed to explain cities. You know, when you're living in proximity with tens of thousands of people for the first time in American mm-hmm. cultural history, you just kind of wonder, why is that person doing well and I'm not? And like proximity breeds comparison. It breeds um, explanation and cheap paperbacks designed to sell you the solution. Yeah. And one of the solutions that it sold was a story that had begun to consolidate when it was trying to imagine. So it was like the beginning of the discipline of psychology and people mm-hmm. are, are trying to understand like, do we have power in our mind to change our circumstances? Mm. And so this huge subcurrent of religious and cultural thought centered around the idea that these like righteous individuals mm-hmm. could just harness the power of their attitude and their mind yeah. and their will. And yeah. like there's just a version of bootstrapping and that they could transform their lives. And yeah. You know, it, it, it channels into these versions of religious history we think of as purely metaphysical, like new age, new thought. Mm-hmm. Actually, so I, I got this for my birthday. It's, uh, it's it just says, um, you'll see my microphone instead, but it just says, um, <laughs> zero dreams into the universe since 1980. It's so amazing. <laughs> Like the idea, and we talk about it all the time, like, you know, good vibes and. Oh, yeah. Um, like you're supposed to perform the mental strategies that mm-hmm. will make your life better. Right. And I mean, Christians, man, they got on board with that. They pretended to hate it. But like already by the 20s, there were tons of Christian paperbacks that came out that were like, you know what? I need mean, mm-hmm. faith. Faith is the thing. Faith, yeah. faith is the tool. And so like when they say trust God, I'm sure you're like, yeah, to do what? Like right. what's, what's the thing I'm supposed to do? to enter into this miraculous transaction. Well, and isn't it wild how we've even almost evolved the meaning of the word faith to mean have faith. What, what people meant when they said that to me is trust that God will give you a good thing. But that's not faith. That's not what faith is, right? No. Faith no. is believing in the unseen. It's not expecting, you know, that God is Santa Claus. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, but expect, and, if expectation is spiritual work, and that's the part that is, like, mentally screwed up. Mm-hmm. You can that guess. That is the <laughs> absolute, I, it, it is a deep Christian fuck-up. Yeah. That we imagine that our expectation harnesses a spiritual power that makes yes. God real. God yeah. is already real. Right. Like, I could be like lying in a hospital bed and God and I, and still have faith and trust and hope. Yeah. Like it's not a magical yes. thing we perform and that's gotten super confused in people's minds and yes. they put that crap and especially they put that crap on women. So yes. Yes. Your whole miscarriage account, it just like broke my heart because they just expected you to perform like a, a real positivity that like God was going to bring, you know, well, and- that was good story up. And even after that, you know, it was interesting because then I did go on to adopt and then I did go on to have two, I carried two pregnancies to term um, of 10 total. And then I had people say, well, you know, if you hadn't miscarried, you wouldn't have adopted Jafta. And, or, you know, well, thank goodness for the miscarriages because you obviously, you know, God had a different plan. And I'm just like, no, I still don't feel that way. Like I, my family has worked out so perfectly and I, I love, you know, I love my kids and I still wish I hadn't gone through any of it. And I'm sure you feel that way too, you know, like I I wish that didn't happen to me. Yeah. But then they're asking you to do the mental work of gratitude. Like when you're in yeah. the horrible thing, they ask you to perform optimism. And then mm. when you're done, then they ask you to perform gratitude. And like, yeah, when do you just get to stop right. performing right. and be like, you know, like, okay, that was the worst. Yeah. And yet still somehow I am a beloved creature of God. Yeah. Yes. But I yeah. want off the train. I just but, want off the performance train. But it's like, 
it feels like that story doesn't sell well. The story of just like, yeah, really bad things happened and God was available for comfort, but not solution, you know, wasn't a solution fairy for me. Like that's, it feels like that story doesn't sell well, right? That story doesn't write, you know, sell paperbacks. <laughs> no, no. In fact, it's funny. That's exactly what Sarah and I were talking about in the podcast yesterday. Was she just said, because she's a perfect, sorry, Sarah Bessie. Sarah Bessie, yeah. A recent uh, book, um, Miracles and Other Reasonable Things. Yes. Did I get the title right? Yes. Um, one of my favorite parts about Sarah Bessie's story is that in Pentecostalism, the tradition she's from, um, there's such a, a thick language of expectation that God can be there for more than simply like comfort and other yeah. therapeutic benefits. Like sometimes God like breaks into history and changes things, but then other times God doesn't. Mm -hmm. And like that we need a, a, an account because I think it's so funny because all my progressive friends in the second year, like I'm praying for a miracle. They're like, oh, let's lower your expectations. <laughs> It's like, let's get it done. I'm out. In the <laughs> I don't want to feel awkward for you when it doesn't yes. go well. So like, let's just bring it down a notch. And then all the, you know, and then the more so supernaturalists, they're just like miracle or bust. Yeah. <laughs> you get like yeah. everything or nothing. <laughs> but you know, how does that feel for you when people offer you that miraculous prayer? You yeah. know? Stressful. Right? Yes. Like, yes. like, I kind of want I, people to yeah. hear what that other side feels like. When, yeah, when it, people come yeah. in strong with like, we're just going to, we're going to pray for a miracle. Like, I, I don't, I, I have to really, okay. I, okay. I have like, I have mixed feelings. Yeah. One overwhelming feeling is when this doesn't work out, you will think I failed. Yeah. Like God will never fail in your story. Yeah. I'll be the one who fails. If I, when I still die of cancer, you're going to think. Mm-hmm man, she just, she really didn't pray for that miracle. Mm -hmm. She didn't, she didn't do this. She didn't do that. So part of it is that. Mm -hmm. I also have, I also sort of feel I'm, I'm just in a more, you know, I, I teach at Duke Divinity School. So it's like a mainline seminary. And sometimes some of the more like progressive -y mainline denominations, they're just like not big uh, prayers, mm -hmm. like, and they're certainly not out loud prayers. And it mm -hmm. kind of felt like they were just too polite to mm -hmm. hope that I would still live. And like the politeness was killing me. Oh, and I was like, so Hey, I'm actually really struggling. And yeah. I'm like, you're asking me to tell you what's going on. I can't even help, but like my, you know, cry all the time. And mm -hmm. you're just like, well, well, hope that works out. <laughs> and actually, as Christians, we have a little more than that. Like we yes. can pray for each other. And so yes. sometimes I felt a little relieved that they just kind of wanted me to live enough to like break the barrier of small, of Christian small talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I think it takes like a really close friend that can help like step into that tender place and, and, and like believe that your body is good enough for God to heal, but not mm. make it feel your responsibility yeah. to save yourself. And that's Gosh, like a yeah. delicate little place. So I, don't know. I only had a couple people who are like really good at that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is really the tension, isn't it? It's, it's that you know, believing that you're worthy, but not that your worthiness can control it. Yeah. 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 Yes. Worthy, but not in control would be like a really nice, soft place, I think, for yeah. those of us who are like openly suffering. Like, how did you feel? Were you like, please pray for my body and for its, you know, and for fertility? Like, how did you, how did you square the, like the hard edges you were I had a really hard time when people would want to come and pray for me in the middle of a miscarriage because, oh. you know, I also believe in science and like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know that the amount of things coming out are that like, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. Like, you know, yeah. when, when I'm like actively miscarrying, like I know how this ends. Yeah. I don't think this is just going to like... <laughs> Yeah. The bleeding will stop and I won't be having a miscarriage anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or there were times where, you know, maybe I'd had an ultrasound and, and it had been confirmed. There's no heartbeat left. And so I felt when people prayed for a miracle for me in that, I felt angry, There's angry. A cruelty. There's yeah. a cruelty. Just like that. you guys are yeah. not like real. Yeah. We got to be in reality here, guys. Yeah. 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 Yes. That's such a powerful point, Kristen. There's a, there is a cruelty to that. And yeah, like, cause it, it creates like a weird brinksmanship. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just felt like 
I wanted to crawl out of my skin, like, guys, look at what's happening, you know, look at what's happening here. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. just be in reality. It's dishonest. Yes. Yeah. That makes complete sense to me. Cause I haven't yet been at the point where I was like, <laughs> sorry for all this candor. <laughs> You're just really making me think. Yeah. I, I hadn't really ever been to the point where I was, it was definitely too late. Right. I was always at the point where it was almost too late. And so mm -hmm. when someone gave, when someone stopped praying for me, it felt like they were giving up on me. Mm -hmm. That makes if sense. I was at the point where I needed my family and everyone to like rally and to just like shut it down in yeah. a faithful way, if someone prayed for me then, I would be like, you don't love me yeah. in the way that you need to love me. Yeah. So I can see what you're saying. Yeah. I, or it I, felt I like it was more for them to feel some you know, sense of power and control, because really that's yes. what we want, isn't it? At the end of the day, we're all looking for control, even yeah. over the stories of our friends, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but what does your story say about my story? Exactly. What if your... <laughs> Like, I don't like how this narrative is making me feel. I feel like you're, and I think this is true about, um, you know, like the way people frame, like the second one person gets divorced, they're like, oh no, that's giving me a lot of mm -hmm. marriage, marriage questions. Oh, yeah. it's so true. Right. And so I do think pain and suffering, especially, you know, I think it's interesting even having these conversations because I think if we, you know, had grown up in a country where suffering is a little more tangible and real, you know, we, we live in a lot of privilege. We, you know, we, we aren't a, as acquainted with death and grief and suffering as many other countries, right? Yeah. And it's almost like that's one of the reasons we get so inspired when we go on mission trips, you know, and people say dumb things like, I saw Jesus in their eyes, or, you know, they had so much joy despite, you know, it's like we can't conceive of life with pain because we've been so shielded from it with our modern medicine and our, you know, yes. right? And, like, yes. and I feel like even some of our theology, for me, the minute the theology broke down was like, you go visit Haiti and you're like, listen, <laughs> there's no such thing <laughs> as having enough faith to be saved from suffering because all these people are faithful and yeah. it, and they're all, you know, yeah. And their, their families being decimated by malaria or, you know, yeah. so, or an earthquake, you know, but I feel like the reason that we get to sit in these crazy faulty theologies is because of privilege, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. because we've just not experienced in, you know, in our twenties or thirties, maybe, um, yeah, true suffering. Yeah. And, and so I like that. I like that theory. I'd also say like in the little sort of tripod of humanity, you know, for like heart, body, and, you know, mind uh -huh. that like for a hundred years, we have way overinflated the mind component. Mm, and talk we to have me gotten, about that. Well, I think like, I think we've gotten very confused about how much, and I, part of this is because of the mainstreaming of, of, of psychology, frankly, yeah. that we, we, we've replaced that as a spiritual category for, for what is primarily us. Like if you ask someone mm. what they are, they usually think that they are just a working mind. Yeah. And then we use all this language, like you're a therapist, you're more familiar with this than I am. Oh, and like, you totally. know, we start every sentence with, with largely therapeutic idioms. Like, yeah, I feel that, or, mm -hmm. you know, we have a, a, a huge vocabulary for how, Mm -hmm. We are, we are thoughts that need to be corrected yes. and we are, we are, I'm sure thoughts that need to be corrected. Yes. But I do think that churches got confused in thinking that our brains were the primary driver of faith. And if we just mm -hmm. had the right thoughts, everything would work out. Mm. And I think we all know experientially that, um, that righteous people die every day yeah. and terrible, terrible people thrive. And yeah. And that the place in between is knowing that like we are some weird combination in there of heart and body and mind and all of them are beloved by God and none of them are really in control of the universe. <laughs> that, I mean, that is the truth. Like, I just feel like you explained it all. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm, the truth. I'm going to put zero dreams out then. Yeah, <laughs> to the universe. Totally. As a result, I mean, it, it it is kind of interesting. You know, my daughter said to me the other day, she's ten, and she said, "I feel like God is not answering my prayers." Mm. You know, and I, it, it's so interesting trying to raise 
children in a way that's different from how I was raised, which was this sort of a little bit of a prosperity gospel, like have enough faith and God will heal you. Yeah. And it, <laughs> I feel like I almost said what your t-shirt said. I mean, I was just kind of like, well, that's not really what he does. <laughs> but <laughs> you could pray for him to come near. Coming yeah. near is in the Bible. <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> and we're hoping for some big surprises. Yeah. We're, really, we're hoping for a big, big finish. We're hoping for yeah. lots of stuff in there that seems really great. I think it's, I think it's, it's hard when, when you've had the language of certainty that's like so weaponized against the tender. Yeah. You want to like, you know, wrap your spiritual arms around the, the tender yeah. folks and not. The overcorrection is to not promise anything. The undercorrection. Mm -hmm. Is, is so true. Allow the culture to weaponize yeah. suffering. Yeah. Well, and I mean, to be fair, her prayer, unanswered prayers were a, <laughs> in regards to me giving her more screen time. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's God's job. I'm yeah. glad you're pr praying for that. <laughs> that's my job. And I say no. Yeah. Actually, it's weird, but our a message from our Lord and Sovereign God's coming in. And yes. God's, God's definitely saying no. It's weird yeah. I heard. Actually. Got my earpiece in, and he <laughs> feels like 30 minutes is enough for you. <laughs> Screen time. That's so funny. You know that your kid is, like, really privileged when their, like, fervent nightly prayer is, like, about screen time. Like, what kind of life are you living? <laughs> totally. totally. I'm starting to count the number of times I say things like, um, uh, no, you can't watch one more of that. Also, whose blood is that? I mean, there's just a lot of... <laughs> totally. I'm really getting... What I'm is... Really getting there. I feel like every day I walk downstairs, I'm like, what? What is this rated? <laughs> This is. <laughs> we watch this Hellboy. It's like the best afterthought ever. Right? Hey, guys. hey oh. <laughs> oh, well. I also do that with my children <laughs> a lot. Like, we start watching a show and then I'm like, <laughs> cool. Should have cool. Googled this one first. Yeah. I'm just going to undo that from your minds. Oh, That's man. Fair. Well, we forget how crass those 80s movies were. Yeah, Back to the Future is more than I remember. Um, airplane has boobs. Airplane <laughs> has boobs, like naked boobs. Yeah. How do I know that? Because I showed it to a bunch of boys at a slumber party. So then, you know, I get to, like, send a text to all the parents, like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Your kids saw some boobs in my house. <laughs> I want that's, you to hear it from me. That's very much a text I would like to see a screenshot of. <laughs> well, because I'm thinking they're going to hear it out of context, yeah. right? The yeah, kid's yeah. just going like, to go home and be like, we watched boobs at Jaffa's house. They, we were shown boobs. We were shown yeah. boobs. Yeah, we were sat down and instructed to look at boobs at that home. <laughs> now we're just totally off topic, but I have this David Sedaris coffee table book. It's like his journals. It's a big book. It sits on our coffee table. And there was some, like, there were some penises you know, there was some casual, casual man standing around with everything out. And my kids were like, no, this can't sit out. <laughs> and I'm like, I, there's a part of me that's like, it's the human body, you know, whatever. <laughs> but then there's a part of me that's like, I know that this is going to be the story of the Howerton house is that they have, they have penis pictures on the coffee table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to answer for this by text. No. So I yeah. took a Sharpie and I drew a Speedo. <laughs> Overall, win-win. All of the penises. Anyway, <laughs> I'd, say, I'd, I'd say that's that's called compromise. It is. Yes. Anyway, um, all right. I love your book so much. I really do. Aww, I I, I, I cannot it. recommend it enough. I think Thanks. you find such a lovely balance between sort of pushing back on some of these narratives, but then not. Your book is not about putting zero out into the universe. It's not, you know, it, it is a lovely balance of, of figuring out um, what narratives are not serving us well and, you yeah, know, thanks. how to move it, you know. I, and I, I love talking with people like you where I feel like we've maybe challenged our faith and deconstructed it a little bit, but it's still there, right? Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah. not that we're not being snarky because we've walked away. We're being snarky because we're still in it and we still love it and we want it yeah. to be good. And, 
Yeah. And we want our faith and, you know, people's experience of God to be healthy and whole and non-toxic. Yeah. And I think like for, you know, when we, when we sort of take a minute to rest on the harder moments of our lives, the, the, the moments of real undoing, those are moments in which the stories we were told, like they didn't, they didn't make, they didn't show us who God could be Mm -hmm. and they didn't allow us to experience a God who could love us throughout in a way we needed to hear. And like, and simultaneously we get that like every story of God needs to be able to account for our biographies. So like the prosperity gospel has this terrible way of telling you that every single thing in your life is proof. Mm -hmm. The opposite of that is not that absolutely nothing in our lives is proof. I would love to look around and Mm -hmm. feel like the goodness of God, like shining back to me in like gorgeous people I get to meet. Yeah. But without, without imagining then that like, Mm -hmm. that everything is also a weapon used against me. Yeah. Certainty was a thing I was supposed to figure out a long time ago. Right. Or without rewriting people's pain to, I mean, I, you know, I mean, we joked about this at the very beginning, but just without rewriting a narrative that says that when someone loses a child or loses a loved one, that like God's really going to bring this to his glory. Like, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. not what, you know, God doesn't give us pain for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I settled on the idea that I'm over lessons, but I'm not over meaning. Yeah. Like, like that, like, yes, God can be found in the darkest, most terrible places. Yeah. And I have found beauty and honesty and goodness there. But that is not to say that if I could choose, I wouldn't go back. I wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to, um, your book will be linked up below oh, our, yeah, thanks our, so much. our things, but where can people find you like online, Instagram, oh, Facebook, yes. all that good stuff. I am on the interwebs at katebowler.com and I've got, uh, I was just, sorry, I'm pausing because I'm thinking about how great your Instagram feed is, which is there. <laughs> but I'm also on Instagram <laughs> at, uh, uh, and Twitter at Kate C. Bowler. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. I'm so glad we did this. Me too.